Hi, everyone, and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show on Twitch where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. And hi, everyone who's watching from Party Real. It's exciting to have you here. This is our annual year in review live stream where we look at the exciting happenings in the last year in the Unreal Engine and Epic Games communities. Um, I'm your host, Victor Broden, and joining us today from the comforts of our own homes are Epic, uh, Tim Sweeney, Epic CEO and founder, Brian Karras, Technical Director of Graphics, Grayson Edge, Senior Cinematic Designer, and last but not least, Amanda Shade, Fellow Community Manager. Welcome all to the show today. Uh, we have plenty of exciting topics to talk about, but first I would, let, I would like to let everyone know in chat that you can submit questions for our guests today at twitch.tv slash Unreal Engine. And now let's dive into today's first topic. I think without question, the hottest topic in the games industry today or this year is the release of next-gen consoles, which brings many advancements in hardware and core technologies. Um, we know that lots of studios are already shipping next-gen games with Unreal, Unreal Engine 4. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit to you all about um, what is it about the next-gen consoles that has you the most excited about the future of the games industry? I can, I can go on that. Um, immersion, for me, is going to be something really cool. I think that uh, the amount of immersion and realism in video games is really exciting, and the amount of technology that's behind that. I think that, um, you know, when I was younger, I, there was a lot of things I wanted to see with video games, and I feel like we're now just getting into that area where it's just so, becomes very realistic and very immersive and very cool. So I think there's a lot of really exciting stuff for the, the player, but I also think for creatives, I think there's a lot of great stuff as well. Um, it's inspiring to, to create. I'll, I'll have to hold myself off from nerding out too much, but <laughs> there's, there's a lot of great, uh, a lot of great advancements that happen in this hardware that is enabling a lot of new software techniques. The the RDNA architecture for the GPUs for the for these new consoles is is great. The amount of power is just as far as the pure like teraflops that these things can can push out is is a a very big step from what we had before. Um, the fact that we've got some some real uh, like full powered CPU cores um, opens up a lot a lot of uh, possibilities from the gameplay code perspective. Um, it'll it'll be a lot less trouble for us to ship games that that would have been fine on a PC but would have struggled on a console. Now that we've got real CPU cores um, that, that would be similar to what you have on the PC, making those making uh, something that can work across both is going to be a lot less difficult. And then of course, the, the other uh, major uh, change is, is the SSD hard drives um, and the IO infrastructure supporting them. Like being able to stream with the extremely low latency and, uh, and high bandwidth off of those drives enables, I mean, the obvious things of, of less load times, which really helps gameplay just as a gamer being able to die and then reload immediately <laughs> that's pretty cool <laughs> not having to wallow in your <laughs> so much better. um but it also enables things that aren't just that sort of like typical like load screen how long is my load screen but it enables us to be able to move things in and out of ram um very quickly and a lot so like uh what what used to be such a critical component which is how much ram did the machine have um is still you know important how much working ram you have it still matters but it matters a lot less if you can cycle things in and out of RAM from the drive. Uh, it just enables a lot more, a lot bigger worlds, richer, more, more vibrant worlds, because there's a lot more data that, that can be there and we can move it in and out uh, really fast. Yeah, it's the immersion stuff that really gets me excited. The, the technologies you're talking about, that's the stuff that's- Yeah, and it all enables that. All that stuff, enables yeah. the immersion. Like yeah. that's, that's, that's the sort of foundational atomic blocks that enable that sort of immersive thing. Yeah, it's really cool. And and here at Epic, what did we do to get ready for all of this in terms of preparing Unreal Engine for next gen? Uh, well, we've been preparing for a while. It, like it's there is evolutionary jumps that that happen. Like we've been working on uh, a virtual texturing system in the past that can can support like really large resolution textures, and we can get um, you know that. Having the, the low latency, high bandwidth SSD drives is something that supports that. But then we also, for, for UE5, uh, decided to invest in a number of, of technologies that are really only possible with the next generation hardware. Um, the two of which that were like key things that we showed off and in, our, uh, in our last tech demo was uh, Nanite virtual 
uh, geometry, like micro polygon level uh, rendering tech, and uh, Lumen, our, our dynamic GI system that gives like really beautiful lighting that's completely dynamic with no bake times. Those, those two technologies together are really kind of this like per perfect recipe for enabling these new experiences and, and visuals that are like far beyond what we could have even like imagined possible with, with the, the previous set of techniques. If you are unaware about what Brian is talking about right now, a little bit later, we're going to show you a video that showcases some of these technologies. Super Sorry, I jumped the gun a bit. Uh, okay. I'm so That's excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yeah, and like the, these efforts were, were pretty long tail efforts. Like we've, it's been investment um, that we've been doing over, over multiple years uh, of looking forward and where we thought the technology was going to be. We, we had access and, and collaborated with, with both Sony and Microsoft on what, what this next generation hardware would be. But some of it is also a bit of just, you know, guessing where things are going, what sort of possibilities that we had to, to exploit. Um, and try to, you know, get our foothold in there early. Yeah, you know, there's been some amazing wizardry in this generation on the code side, but uh, content is also a really important consideration. Um, Unreal Engine 5 can render 100 million uh, polygon geometry, but that doesn't mean an artist can just sit down and create one over the course <laughs> of an afternoon <laughs> or a week, right? So uh, Epic's done a huge amount of investment in next generation content pipelines and building content libraries like with the Quixel Megascans library. Uh, bringing Quixel into the Epic family and making all of the content available to Unreal Engine developers so you can, like we did with the Nanite demo, uh, just bring in all of that content that's been scanned from the real world um, and then adjust it and tweak it to meet your needs and build entire environments without having to build every piece by yourself. That's, that's yeah. really, really exciting. Yeah, yeah it's, it's an incredible data set. The quality of, the, of those assets is really high. Uh, I, I remember some years ago when uh, I was first talking with artists about photogrammetry, where there was initially a fear of, oh, you're going to make our jobs obsolete. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. It's like, really, we're just getting rid of some of the, the boring tests. Like how, how much creative effort is it going to go into making just like a boulder? Really, the, your creative output is really about what you use that thing for and to make something interesting out of it, not the the amount of hours that go into just like replicating some real world object. That's right, it's, it's really quite astonishing. And for anybody on the stream who hasn't seen it, uh, Google Quixel, Q-U-I-X-E-L, and just check out the massive library of uh, scans of assets all around the world at movie quality resolution um, that's now possible to render in real time. Yeah, and they keep adding more and more all the time. It's really, really incredible seeing all the work they're doing. Using real world scans, in fact, so they're actual, actual real world items. Um, we're going to go back a little bit to talk about Unreal Engine 5 in just a bit. Um, before that, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about what happened back in August when Epic uh, gave Fortnite players on iOS and Google Play a choice between Apple and Google Payment and Epic Direct Payment, passing on savings to players. Uh, both Apple and Google retaliated by blocking Fortnite updates and kicking the game off their stores. Now, Epic has taken up the fight for fair terms on digital stores in an effort to give developers a more level playing field and to open up more choices for, uh, and freedoms to everyone. Tim, would you want to give us a little bit of information on what all this is about? Sure. You know, this is one of the most important things that we've done in our history. Um, you know, all developers kind of live under the thumb of Apple and Google. Uh, you know, who exert total control over the supply of apps for uh, iOS and Android. Um, and they do this in slightly different ways. Uh, Apple by explicitly banning all competitors um, and Google by just making it harder to install competing software. Um, but you know, this is a fight for the entire game industry and the future of the industry. Um, if, if these monopolies can not only control the supply of games, but also control curation and say that entire categories of new new applications like xCloud um, and NVIDIA's GeForce Now um, and Google Stadia cannot exist um, on iOS devices, then um, it's going to be a really bleak, bleak future for everybody uh, who is a creator of any sort. Um, and uh, so we, we decided to fight this. Um, and you might have heard of the code name that was leaked at some point. Uh, it uh, was called Project Liberty internally. Um, and our aim is to really, really change the status quo and open up the app uh, 
app stores on mobile platforms uh, so that all developers have an equal chance. And every component of the ecosystem, from payments um, to stores to engines um, and friend services and everything else, can compete freely. Um, you know, resulting in better deals for developers and better uh, better deals for consumers as well. Um, and yeah, you know, this effort launched uh, back in August, but uh, we've already seen some major changes um, in the mobile ecosystem. You know, Apple lowered uh, their revenue share from 30% to 15% for um, for developers who make less than a million dollars a year. Um, that's really interesting because it, it means that that's about 98% of developers benefit from that, um, but only about uh, only about 5% of purchases uh, are made uh, you know, from the games built by these small developers. And so it really doesn't help consumers at all. And do it doesn't do anything to restore competitive pricing um, that would exist if, uh, if these 30% taxes weren't being collected. Um, and so this is an ongoing fight. Um, you know, the, the cases uh, will go on. Um, the Apple case is set for trial next year in May, um, the Google trial uh, 2022. And, um, there's going to be a lot happening in the meantime on the regulatory front. Um, it's really a great opportunity for the community to come together and you know, fight for, for our futures as creators so that um, everybody, every creator in the future, including those who haven't even been born yet, have the chance um, that I had when I was a kid, which was to build software on my own, to release it directly to, to gamers, um, and to not have to ask a middleman for permission um, to do those things. Exciting times, special times for sure. Uh, a lot of unusual things have happened this year. That's, that's definitely definitely the case for all of us. Um, why don't we go ahead and, and play the free Fortnite video uh, for all of you who haven't seen that. Today, we celebrate the anniversary of the platform unification directives. For years, they have given us their songs, their labor, their dreams. In exchange, we have taken our tribute our profits, our control. This power is ours and ours alone. We shall prevail. Interesting references there. <laughs> <laughs> nice hat, Tim. <laughs> the hats are key to the battle. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, if you hadn't seen it before, there it was. It's a great uh, testament to the, the initiative at large. Um, so moving on to probably Unreal Engine's biggest announcement of the year. Earlier, we announced Unreal Engine 5. It was our first showcase, or the first showcase of pixels running live on the PlayStation 5 with Lumen in the Land of Nanite. So if you haven't seen that video, we'd like to go ahead and show it for you now.
So the demo showcases both the new virtualized micro polygon te geometry technology, Nanite, and Lumen, a fully dynamic global illumination solution. And these are what Brian was sort of mentioning earlier. Uh, would you kind of dive into that a little more and actually the impact that it'll have on developers uh, in this next generation? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, with, with Nanite, you get this ability to bring in uh, like film quality, like super high poly assets without the, the need to do major optimization steps beforehand. This like trims down the amount of time it takes to take a really high quality asset, bring it in and be able to see it uh, live and not just see it for the first time, but to be able to actually ship that asset at its, at its full quality and build a whole world with, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of those, uh, of those objects in the world or, Millions, I guess we actually support. <laughs> Sometimes these numbers actually get away from me. It's, you, you can buy millions of these objects now. Uh, it's it's pretty incredible. And then uh, then Lumen for uh, the real time global illumination. You can give like actually dynamic worlds and changing light sources, moving objects around, uh, and not have to go through these like long bake steps to be able to see the the process. Like for a lighting artist to be able to just put their lights where they want them to be, interactively place it and just see it live, just real time. You know, what you see is what you get sort of workflows uh, are really powerful from the, from the content creator and the things that it enables for the, for the game, for the, the worlds to be more dynamic. Uh, so those were two really interesting technologies, uh, really cool stuff that we showed off in the demo, but there's a lot more that, that is, is coming along with, with UE5, a lot of content workflows, like, animation technology, sound system. There's, there's a ton of the cooking pipeline, the editor workflows. That, like there's, you know, the list goes on and on of things that are going to be in UE5. And uh, I think what's also cool here is like, this is just where we're starting. Like this is the, this is the beginning. Like this is, this is amazing, the beginning right? of the generation. And like, this is already what stuff looks like. I just, it's really exciting to see where we go. It's like all the, the you know, different ideas that we have yet to actually to try uh, different pieces of technology that we've we haven't really been able to to push to their fullest extent, um, the, you know aspects of the hardware that we're just now be able to exploit. So it's it's really exciting to see like this is where we're starting. Yeah, I remember watching this demo for the first time and getting so many goosebumps just like <clears throat> in awe at the story and all of the pieces behind it and knowing what like and like you said thinking about the potential of the games coming in the future. So it's like can't imagine what we're going to see even beyond and, and from the folks in our community digging into this. And it's just a really exciting, exciting time to be in development, right? Yeah, it really is with the cinematic you know, type of stuff, especially as well. It just, there's so much great quality stuff that you can get with this technology. It's really exciting, beautiful stuff. Yeah, a, a big aspect of what we're driving for for UE5 is this sort of um, like just works as a pillar of the engine. Like we want to make it so that a content creator can, you know, make make their assets, make their content in the way that is easy for them to make, um, in a way that like hits the detail level that they want. They can bring it into the engine, or you know, create it in the engine in that way initially, and not have to work through so many like technical details and what it takes to hit, you know, your real time frame rates or what it takes to to actually like realize the thing that they're trying to shoot for. Uh, try to like minimize that gap between what they imagined or what was easy for them to create and what they could ship and like shrink that gap down to as small or if nothing at all as, as possible so they could just you know create the thing and ship the thing. And for those that are super excited to get their hands on these tools, you know, we'll be going into preview in early 2021. This will be the time to try them out. We'll be trying to gather as much feedback as much as possible so that we can really make a solid, solid launch, which we're aiming for at the end of 2021. Um, also in line with our UE5 announcements, uh, we did revise our royalty system, you know, as to accept or requesting only 5% once $1 million is earned. Uh, uh, Tim, would you give some uh, feedback on like what inspired us to make this change? It's a pretty significant jump from our old old system. Uh, yeah, it was a funny process. Uh, <laughs> somebody uh, suggested uh, Epic exempt the first $100,000 of uh, revenue uh, from royalties on Twitter just because uh, of the difficulty of being an indie developer and getting a game off the ground. Um, so, like I brought that into a meeting 
Um, and uh, the team talked about it. And Dan Vogel, who is uh, you know extraordinary engineer and very analytic, said, "Why only a hundred thousand dollars?" We had we had a long discussion about what is the threshold at which uh, like. A developer is actually still struggling. Um, yeah. you know, if you're one person, a million dollars is a lot. But if you're a team of a, uh, you know, ten or fifteen people uh, working for a year or two, um, then it might not be a lot at all. And so uh, uh, we settled on that number eventually. And um, yeah, guess what? It's being validated uh, because Apple now uh, changed uh, their terms to give uh, these uh, sub-million-dollar uh, indie developers a, a special deal as well. And so I think this is a great, great deal and. A kind of a great direction in, in the industry to acknowledge that this challenges of companies launching their businesses um, and, and to really support them this way. Coming from once being on a small indie team and at the time of launch, realizing that, oh, wait, now we actually have to send money to people because we are actually about to do this, right? And then knowing that, oh, no, it's only if we succeed that we actually have to worry about this, right? And so if you're using, say, Unreal Engine and Blender, you can just develop your game, ship it, and if you succeed, you now, you know, and succeed pretty, pretty well, I would say, hitting that $1 million bar. Um, and at that point, you can actually start, you know, maybe potentially bringing in someone to help you with all of that instead of just being, you know, some, a couple of scrappy developers who just want to make awesome games. It's super exciting. Um, Grayson, you touched on it a little bit briefly, but the cinematics. I think it's impossible to talk about, uh, you know, 2020 without mentioning virtual production. Um, and to, to kick off this conversation, I want to mention that small little nice anecdote that got brought to us, which is the fact that the first use of virtual production was actually back in 2001 when Spielberg used Unreal Tournament to block out shots for the movie AI. Um, I thought this was an amazing anecdote. I have no <laughs> idea about this. Um, and it's cool to see how far back people have actually been thinking about the possibility that we are now today seeing, um, seeing become reality. Yeah, there's some really exciting things going on there. And I, I feel like um, obviously virtual production, you know, there's a lot of different definitions of virtual production. And, and I've always kind of thought of, of where the real world and the, and the digital world meet um, in many ways. And I think that it's a, it's a cool space to work in because like for, especially for things like previs, it obviously has much larger applications than that in terms of final pixels out of the engine. Um, but I do think that previs is a very, very powerful tool, especially for filmmaking and having done, you know, very minimal directing at Epic or working on, let's just say working on cinematics and different events and things. I feel like very quickly being able to uh, determine what you're going to make, have a lot of people look at it and agree upon that thing is really important. And so I feel like just, this is a very base level of virtual production. I think it's very, very powerful to be able to present people your ideas clearly um, in a form that, you know, that they can understand. And I think it's, um, and so, I think it's really, you know, it's a really powerful tool. Um, the engine, you basically using the engine for those type of things is, is really awesome. And so um, there's a lot of different applications for virtual production with the engine. And we can talk about that a little bit more as we, maybe as we go on here, but, but uh, yeah, suffice to say that I think there's a lot of exciting things happening in the space right now. And I think being creative, um, I think it's, it kind of like Brian was mentioning earlier too, it really helps you you know, realize your vision of things and see these things and then start to build on them very quickly, kind of jump starts you in a lot of ways. Yeah, both the production side and the creative, right? The fact that you can just immediately see what's going on instead of having to wait for a couple of days of render or... Yeah, and I mean, also it gives you, just not besides, just, you know, besides just the creative elements, it gives you a good idea of scope, tone, you know, some of the things that you'll need to be, uh, you know, if you're trying to make a movie, some of the things you may have to, you know, consider um, when you're doing that, or if you're making a music video or something else like that, it just gives you a lot of information very early on. And it's very, for me, you know, it's very easy to jump in the engine and you know, develop stuff like that and just start to get the idea of what, you know, what we're doing with something. Yeah, so. getting past that, like just blank sheet of paper sort of problem. Getting yes. things up. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's exactly. just the beginning of the pipeline when you're visualizing the movie. Um, then you go and produce it. Um, a lot of these productions are now using Unreal Engine for real-time rendering of backgrounds. Uh, so as the director is looking through the camera, they're filming an actor in front of, um, instead of a green screen, an LED panel displaying you know, exactly what's happening um, in the movie set around them. And actors can look around the set and see exactly the, the environment they're in. Um, and so it gets kind of back to the magical movie production era uh, before you know, computer graphics were introduced at all um, in which uh, 
a large part of the magic of the movie comes from improvisation of the set on the director looking through the camera and finding a shot that wasn't necessarily planned out um, and, and making the magic that way. And then at the very end of that process, you have uh, digital assets for this entire production, um, which you know, open it up to really easily applying the same you know, meshes and textures and, and characters in games um, or you know, in any sort of experience uh, that you might want that's uh, interactive or digital. Um, and you know, Fortnite has had some crossover events where you have uh, you know, Star Wars uh, characters pop in or Marvel characters or John Wick. Um, but the next phase of this is a seamless pipeline um, from movies and television shows and other creative works um, into games um, without delay and you know, with mass community participation. Yeah, it's really cool. And it's talked a little bit about the immersion too. And you mentioned this, Tim, is that, you know, as an actor or even as a director, you can jump in to, so you make this in virtual environment. In some cases, you make your set, or you make, you know, the thing that you're trying to shoot and you can put on a, you know, VR headset, or you can use an augmented reality device um, or an AR headset. Uh, and you can look around and so you can give direction in, uh, in a virtual space, either you know on the stage that you're capturing the data in, or you can do it remotely as well, and so um, that's a really powerful tool. And then also for an from an acting perspective, it's really cool to actually be in the environment that you're going to be acting in. And in some cases, you can see your own avatar, um, or if you have props, you know you can see those as well. And from having worked with a few actors, uh, it's really exciting to see them get into the virtual space and start to understand who their character is. Either you know, they can see it in a headset or they can see it you know, on, a, on a screen of some type, but it really starts to help you get into character. And so interestingly enough, that process makes a lot of acting emergent and we get a lot of really creative, great stuff out of you know, being those characters, being in that world that we didn't ever have planned, which is it's just kind of a lot of fun to, to watch happen. Yeah. And, and the same is true for those LED wall stages. Uh, I got the privilege to, to see a couple of them firsthand and it, it's pretty incredible just seeing like the standing in those volumes, yes. in those backdrops. It, um, yeah. it there could be points there where you it, like it even confuses your own brain. Like where are you? But there was I I just had when I was standing at one of them. I just needed to take this like selfie shot. Like you have to see this and that that selfie shot just like looks like I'm in another place. It yeah, you get close. the light coming off the the screen, yeah. so it, it automatically grounds you in the environment, which is cool. Do you get the sense of presence that you can when you're using a virtual reality device? Uh, not quite, because I mean, you, they don't completely surround you. They they just they go on and everything that the they don't cover the side that the camera has, so they're not a complete volume going in all directions. Um, and you don't get there's no sort of like stereoscopy, so it doesn't look 3D to you. Uh, so it doesn't have quite the same presence, but the key thing is that it's lighting everything properly. That's the thing that the camera really wants to pick up. Uh, but it's certainly better than standing in front of a green screen. That doesn't look like anything at all. <laughs> yeah, the uh, lighting. You get the full presence of, of getting, you know, like everything moves and parallaxes and you can see everything in, in 3D. Um, but it, it does feel like you're there. And the, the nice thing is that if, if you would be acting against another actor, they're going to actually be there as opposed to you know, seeing them through VR um, headset. And you can hold prompts and all that stuff is gonna be physical to you. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's a, it's a major step up from the, I mean, I'm not an actor, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> standing on cool. those stages, that's what it felt like to me. And usually there's some, there's also an element too in, in the foreground with, it, with the actor that can be you know, physical traditional set, and then you have the digital background. So it's, it, is pretty, you know, it is pretty cool to see. And, see all that you know, come, come together. Well, it just makes the whole process more collaborative too, right? Everybody's talking about the experience and the shots and the, the takes in the moment versus having to pass it through different parts of the pipeline. And Yeah, that gets really interesting too with a multi-user and being able to have, in some cases, you're all interacting in the same space. Um, and you can do that there or you can do it remotely. And that's really powerful as well that, you know, instead of saying, hey, can we move this light a little bit over there and somebody having to do that, you can literally reach, in some cases, reach out and grab a light in a virtual space and then you can move it and it will, uh, you know, light in the virtual space and or in the real world. And that's a very cool, um, that's a, you know, that let, lets people collaborate very easily. This LED screen technology that we're talking about, it was popularized this year by the series, uh, The Mandalorian. Um, this is actually the large commercial use of in-camera VFX and in LED volumes. And it has inspired about 100 stages that will be available in the next year. Um, and so this is sort of a new revolution, new movements, and hopefully, you know, 
I think all of the sort of indicators out there are hoping that the technology will, you know, eventually get a little bit cheaper to the point where you can rent a stage, you know, to do your shots for a couple of days and um, just make it more accessible. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to see that. I've seen tons of people even starting to use like their monitors, right? They have a little monitor up and they've set up little action figures and they're starting to use this scene just even on a very small scale. So it, it transverses a lot of that. Yeah, you can use, you know, off the shelf available tracking technology um, like Steam VR to, to sort of simulate that camera tracking. And, and so you can actually do a lot of that stuff already today with the, uh, your available hardware that you might even have uh, for some of your projects. And it's um, really cool to see people build this stuff up from, from a few ideas and you start adding new ideas to it and you get some, it's amazing where you can get to with some of that, which is cool. Yeah. And we are really excited to see what the community um, comes up with in, in the future. Now, uh, Grayson, you did mention we have talked a little bit about sort of the different use cases for virtual production. And I wanted to go ahead and show something that Weta Digital put together uh, using Unreal Engine. Uh, Seth, if you don't mind playing that video for us, please. Now, for those of you who are unaware, that entire short was created entirely inside Unreal Engine, um, which is quite the astonishment using some of our new fur and hair technology uh, alongside um, control rig, which was used to animate the characters. Um, yeah, big ups to Weta Digital and, and everyone at Epic who helped make this a reality. Um, on that note of sort of, you know, creating um, virtual production content or you know, linear media as well as interactive. Uh, we also this year released something called the LiveLink Face App, which allows you to use an iPhone to capture facial uh, animation technology. And you can either capture that for playback later or use it directly in real time in the engine. We actually did see a really fun and interesting um, quick thing that happened. Oh, I should mention the complete mm -hmm. demo project, Meerkat, is available on the marketplace for you to download uh, for use with Unreal Engine 4.26. Uh, go check it out. It's super cool. That's yeah. one of our evangelists. Yeah, go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> and that was just say, we've seen so many cool community creations. Like some people have started, uh, you've seen the meerkat or the video meerkat from the meerkat's perspective. So he's like running and hiding from the eagle or uh, what you were about to mention. One of our evangelists actually made the meerkat into a little talk show. So you see him sitting there behind the <laughs> desk. He's got a little screen. So he's hosting a show. And yeah, that was actually using LiveLink face app, which is, it's really cool to see the various ways these technologies can kind of come together to make even more unique uh, setups. Yeah, the immediacy of that is really cool too, in, in terms of in the past, long, long time ago, we used to have to, we, you know, we have to wait to get the spatial uh, stuff on, on a character, but now just seeing it immediately, you get a great read, you can get an idea of emotions and you can, you can change direction if you need to. But it's very, it's a very powerful tool for um, for seeing things right up front. It's cool. If you're excited about this technology, we're going to go ahead and link some docs and chat for y'all. You can go ahead and it's all available right now. Um, make sure to pop that out. Let's see. Um, there's also been the use case of virtual production inside Fortnite. Does any of you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, I can. I can talk a little bit about, about that. I think that we use uh, virtual production uh, almost daily now for uh, parts of Fortnite, whether we're developing events or we're developing cinematics. 
and we've got a process down uh, that we can jump out to our mocap stage um, and but do it you know remotely virtually so we all join kind of the same way we're joining through Zoom um, and we can also connect through the through the engine and we can see the virtual space together and we can uh, make changes to that space and we can work collaboratively. And so um, we do this, like I said, we do that pretty often. And it's, I find it to be really helpful in developing ideas quickly. And sometimes, you know, traditionally you'll use mocap or a lot of times you'll use mocap to create a final product. Um, but a lot of times what we'll do is, is just explore, explore ideas. And kind of like we were talking about earlier where we can have an actor become an avatar and you can see their facial, you know, their face moving. And so we may come into a, like, uh, in a fortnight sketch or a cinematic with a certain idea. And that can change very quickly based on, uh, we see something that we like a lot more and a lot better. And so overall, the virtual production tools that we have at the studio allow us to work much more quickly and to be more creative than we've ever been able to do in the past. And I think that we're always developing that technology more for our own teams internally, but also working with outside partners to, to um, basically to learn a lot of different you know, parts of things that they're doing and we want to help them and they want to help us because it's a bit of a collaborative effort on that stuff. So, yeah. yeah um, Unreal Build Virtual Production, we actually got to see um, a few ways different people were using virtual production in their own projects, whether it's from you know, the award-winning director, Robert Zemeckis, or how um, creative director, Andrew Jones, was using it in The Mor Mandalorian to um, a number of other creators that are using these pipelines. So if you haven't seen it, we definitely recommend go watch those videos. We have them all on uh, YouTube. And it's, it's really fascinating to see how everybody's using it in their own unique way and how it's elevating their pipelines. And if you'd like to get started yourself, make sure that you go ahead and check out the virtual production primer that we released. All right, I think it's time to move on. Um, goes without saying, saying that another big initiative that we actually um, launched, the initial one was launched over two years ago, but last year at GDC 2019, we announced a new version of Epic Mega Grants, um, which is a $100 million fund that exists for, for uh, different creators around the world. Um, it launched in 2019, and we have, uh, at the time, at time of today, we have almost handed out uh, nearly a thousand talented teams have received grants from the Epic Mega Grant Fund. Uh, Tim, would you like to comment a little bit about it? Oh, sure. This is a, just a, a way of uh, helping developers who, uh, who have made some progress but need a, need a boost um, you know, with funding. Um, often funding makes the difference between um, being able to build and expand a team or get marketing assistance for a game launch um, or to fill some critical need or, uh, or just uh, kind of going on uh, you know, without, without really having a chance to succeed. Um, and so this has been the biggest year for Epic Mega Grants uh, by far um, with a, a much larger dollar amount and a n number of grants uh, issued this year um, than in any past year. Um, and uh, I think uh, this was an interesting time because Unreal Engine usage has exploded. Um, both in game development and in all of these other industries. Um, and usage has expanded in academia. So we've been funding a lot of academic projects um, you know, all, of all different sorts. Um, you know, some at the PhD level and some at the introductory level. Um, and uh, you know, th this will continue. And it's a great, great way for Epic to reinvest back into the community. And um, you know, there's, a, there's a really big team within Epic supporting it. Um, but there's a dedicated team to mega grants as a program, but then a lot of people at Epic who are specialized in any one area um, will be reviewing individual grant uh, applications, given their expertise um, and, and considering each one. And um, it's a very rigorous process. Um, we, we go through a, a huge number of applications and uh, really make sure that everybody receives a fair decision. Yeah, if you are, make sure you apply. We want to see as many of you as possible sending in and seeing what you're working on. There is, there's nothing that is, you know, don't feel like it it's, should be a pressure. We want to see your applications. We want to see what you're working on and we will be happy to review all of them. Um, yeah, so we've actually um, supported a lot of open source projects, even Blender or other game engines like Godot. I was actually curious why you feel it's um, so important for Epic to invest in these open source technologies even beyond sort of our own space and our own tools? Well, you know, the whole industry relies not just on like one piece of software, but an entire ecosystem of components. Um, in a lot of areas, 
you know, the, some of the leading work in the industry is open source. Um, uh, you know, with some of the like subdivision surface work that's been done uh, recently, the, the leading library is open source entirely. Um, uh, you know, there's now a world-class um, polygon modeling tool called Blender, uh, which is increasingly used by, it's been used by, by Indies for a long time, but pros are increasingly adopting it too, because it's trying to make faster progress um, than, you know, 3D Studio Max um, and uh, and Maya, uh, so everywhere we can help, uh, you know, that's just a something we're eager to assist with. And even you know, Godot, the the open source 3D engine that I guess you could say it's a competitor to Unreal, but it's a permissively licensed engine with an incredible set of capabilities, um, and uh, we uh, we're really happy to uh, to grant them a, a major mega grant, which will provide a significant amount of funding and. Um, you know, I think there will be many, many more um, in all aspects of the open source community that is in any way related to uh, the 3D content or digital ecosystems uh, area. Which will ultimately lead to better games, better movies, <laughs> better projects, better everything, right? And so it's very exciting to see. Um, moving on, I did want to talk a little bit about the Unreal Marketplace. For those of you who are unaware, it exists in the Epic Games Launcher. Um, it is a place for creators to sell their content as well as for Epic to provide a lot of content for free. Um, this year, as well as previous year, we released numerous amount of uh, free assets every month as well as perpetual free uh, assets. And now to let you know, the, you're available to use these uh, for free inside your games, inside your movies, inside your um, you know, shorts, novels, whatever. Whatever it, whatever it is you want to use Unreal Engine to create. Um, Amanda, do you want to mention some of the some of the things we did this year? Yeah, sure. So in addition to the five monthly packs and the permanent free content, we've done we have over 80 free permanently free items in our as part of our permanently free content initiative. Um, we've also released an automotive bridge and beach scene. Uh, we also have some really cool community created packs. There was a city park and an, a, a factory environment collection that are absolutely beautiful and have loads and loads of pieces and parts that you should have, feel free to pick apart, add them to your game, modify them. Um, and, and we kicked off the marketplace collection. So adding, you know, joining the ranks of Paragon and Infinity Blade, um, we've added what remains of Edith Finch as assets into our marketplace. So you can actually pull things from the game, add them to your own projects, and we're planning on adding even more new exciting content um, in 2021. But we just always want to remind people that these assets are here for you to use and you shouldn't be afraid of, oh, you know, somebody has that book in their game, so you can't use it. Like, you can modify them, you can prototype with them, you can tear them apart and learn from them, and update them. Update them so they fit in the style of your game uh, or project or scenes. And nobody's going to notice those like, oh, I've seen that stack of books before. I've seen that rock. Like, <laughs> they're not thinking about your game and like picking it apart. Or if they are, like, who cares? The point is that you've been able to more easily and rapidly build the experience you're going for. And so shouldn't be afraid to use them. And we're really excited to be able to continue offering these kinds of assets to the community at large. Yeah, libraries of content are really foundational to be able to get more rapid development of games. Like the, the major creative aspects of, of creating a game experience is not about how one particular little rock or book or something looks. It's about the overall experience. That's what a, what a designer is really going to be looking for. Grayson, you had a good anecdote of what you used the marketplace for. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So I, you know, I went onto the marketplace and we're designing a garden in our backyard. And I was like, man, we could use basically virtual production, same kind of techniques and stuff to design our garden. And so we, that's what I did. I went and wrangled up a bunch of assets, probably spent too much doing that, but it was a lot of fun. And um, we, we built out a garden uh, in a virtual space and it became the plan for our garden. And one of the cool things is I was able to jump in there uh, in a virtual reality headset and look at this garden and we were able to measure it out to, to the foot uh, for everything or to the meter, you know, to, to, to everything. So it was um, kind of cool using marketplace assets. Never know how they're going to come in handy. You never know. It's kind of an interesting project. Love it. Moving on. Um, of course, the, they're all available in the marketplace right now. You can go to underlining.com to, um, to download the launcher and access all of them. And if you are here and you're interested and excited about getting started with game development using Unreal Engine, um, it is available for you right now. There is over 160 hours of content on Unreal Online Learning that you can go and access to get um, the 
from everywhere from the basics into more advanced topic uh, in terms of lighting and um, editing placement code, etc. It's all there at Unreal Online Learning. Better check it out. Um, this year, we also did our first um, bespoke virtual event, um, Unreal Fest Online 2020. Uh, what came out of that was over 40 videos that are now available on YouTube uh, with topics ranging everything from virtual production to games development, architecture, and enterprise. Um, we had over 50,000 people register for the event. It was a great time. Um, do you all have any, any cool anecdotes to share from the event itself? I mean, it was just exciting to see cross industry folks coming in and getting in the same space and, and learning different lessons. Um, all the sessions are really great. Um, and it was a great way to kind of show off some of our other technology too. So we, um, there was an intro introduction to twin motion. So if you're not familiar with it, it's one of the other products here as part of the Epic ecosystem and super easy to use UE based application that helps with visualization, AEC quick for, or great for quickly iterating and building scenes. So it's, it's, Unreal Fest became sort of this, while it's Unreal Fest, it, it was a way for folks to come cross industry, cross tool sets, cross all these things and and enjoy all the parts of their ecosystem, so. A cool Ooh. video in there for the uh, virtual production uh, working remotely, which is really, really great. There's some good information too. And it's, it covers a really wide range of things that you can do with uh, virtual production. So maybe worth checking out. Yeah, this, is, this whole COVID lockdown situation has really shifted those industries to need to work in a more virtual manner. So uh, it, was, it was interesting to hear um, from different voices out there in the industry of like how they're dealing with the, this, you know, 2020 situation that has stuck many of us either away from the, the office, away from the workplace and homes and how can people continue to work? Well, so much of it is happening virtually now. And uh, tools like this are, are enabling that to happen in a way that like either wasn't really the traditional way of working or is now just like a core requirement. Um, Monda, I do want to mention and plug the fact that we have also been doing all of our live streams from home throughout the pandemic. <laughs> and so if you are interested in seeing some of how, uh, how some of our partners and teams at Epic uh, have been working and what we've been doing, go ahead and check out the playlist for Inside Unreal. Uh, it's been exciting. I, I, I remember thinking about Aaron Sims Creative when we had them on. Uh, when we had them on um, and also relating back to sort of how some film studios are considering uh, producing video games. In fact, when I asked that question for Aaron Sims, he said that, yes, they are in fact exploring the possibility of also creating video game based off of the movies that they are creating using Unreal Engine, which I find super exciting to see what comes out of that. You know, uh, teams that are specialized in sort of movie VFX now actually entering, uh, entering the industry of creating video games. Um, Amanda, you touched on this sort of as well, you know, sort of how industries are now just crossing paths um, and these channels are opening up and it allows us to just share knowledge um, and experience and see, um, you know, how the industry at large can grow or all of our industries at large can grow out of that. Uh, super exciting. I do want to go ahead and play at Unreal Fest Online 2020. We debuted the Unreal for All Creators video, which is a really cool masterpiece. We also had them on the live stream talking about how it was produced. Uh, can we please play the video? Creativity lies in all of us. It's what makes us human. It starts with an idea. The desire to create. To solve. To play. To share. To interact. Together we can build new worlds. freedom to create for all.
beautiful little short and promotional piece. If you are Stunning. curious how it was developed, you can go ahead and check out the live stream we did with some of the some of the creators. Um, we also did an asset release for um, the uh, the project that was used in production for the Unreal for All Creators video. Yeah, so if you uh, go to unrealengine.com slash creators, you'll be able to find those assets. Awesome, awesome plug. Um, now, we also want to talk a little bit about the Epic Online Services. Tim, this is a big initiative for us. Would you like to uh, mention what this is about? Yeah, sure. You know, uh, our way of doing things at Epic is to uh, build games and build new technology to support the games and then open up uh, everything to other developers to use themselves. Um, and one of the real success stories of Fortnite is the friend system. Um, there have been more than um, 350 million players coming into Fortnite, um, and they've made more than 2 billion friends um, in, the, in the system. And so we've opened up all of these systems to other developers to use uh, so that uh, their customers can come in and you can have a cross-platform game um, where you have friends across all platforms. And when new players come in, if they've ever played Fortnite and have friends there, then they automatically have all of those friend relationships. You kind of uh, you know, providing the, the kind of functionality that's existed on Steam, Xbox Live, and PlayStation Network, but in a completely cross-platform way that plays really nicely um, with the consoles um, and their existing um, systems. And so uh, you know, that and a whole lot of other services are now available for free to all developers to use in their game. And we're making this free because we, we find that the benefit of having additional games adopt this and bring in their players and their friends um, Growing the social graph uh, benefits all gamers and all game developers, including including ourselves, uh, so much uh, that we felt we would grow it faster and uh, everybody would benefit more if we didn't charge money for it. Um, and so, you know, the Epic Online Services Initiative is available uh, to all developers to adopt for free, and uh, lots of really interesting new features will be coming online over time. Um, anything that you've seen in Fortnite is likely coming to EOS, um, you know, over the next year. The developer portal is available now. You can go ahead and download the SDK and implement it in your game. I have also seen a community-made plugin that exposes the entire API into Blueprints, if that's your um, your preferred way of working with <laughs> Unreal Engine. Um, it exists on the UE Marketplace. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this year in review live stream without making sure that we do a little bit of a shout out to all of the other teams that are working, uh, working with Epic. Um, we'll make sure that we go ahead and mention Cubic Motion, um, three lateral, as well as Quixel. Um, the UE5 demo would not have been possible without Quixel. Um, so make sure we all in chat, please give a big shout out um, to the other teams that are working with us. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> a little clap there. And, uh, and now I think it's time to talk a little bit about the future. Oh, sure. We've talked about a lot of the future already with Unreal Engine 5, <laughs> but um, you know, Epic has been building uh, two sets of developer tools for a long time. Um, one has been the Unreal Engine, uh, which AAA game developers use to produce world-class games that are completely standalone. Um, and the other tool set is uh, Fortnite Creative, um, where tens or hundreds of millions of creators um, have gone in and built built their own environments or played uh, environments built by other creators themselves. And that's trying to turn Fortnite into something bigger than a game. Um, you know, an entire world uh, that is much bigger than Epic's, uh, Epic's, Epic's vision or capacity to build. Um, you know, a world that's everybody's, all of ours together. Um, and you know, we, we envision a future where there are, you know, a huge variety of experiences in Fortnite all created by the community. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that's, uh, that's been in the works for a while now is we've been looking at how to, uh, how to help these worlds come together. Um, and so I want to introduce uh, two long time Epic folks, uh, Carlos Coelho um, and uh, Zach Parrish uh, to come on the stream and uh, show us and uh, talk about some of the efforts that uh, the Fortnite team has been working on. You guys. Hey, hey everyone. Uh, so thanks, Tim. Um, let me just start by, by saying uh, a couple of quick things like, here on the Fortnite team, we use the Unreal Engine and the Unreal Editor to build a game. Um, today, we're going to give you an early preview of our efforts to share those tools with all Fortnite creators. Um, think of this as an extension of the existing creative tool set and not a replacement. Um, and then another thing to think about is that this is an early look and it's, it's very early. So please bear with any rough edges. Um, but we're excited, super excited to show you. And I'm also super excited to be joined by Zach Parrish, um, who's going to be showing us some of the awesome things you can build with the Unreal Editor. 
Hey. Um, so let's actually start by showing a video uh, that we recorded earlier of us building a little shrine, like mini shrine to an old fan favorite, Kevin. Um, so yeah, let's let's cue the video and take a look. Um, yes. Zach, if you want to. Yeah, so uh, here we're actually doing something pretty interesting. We're importing a custom mesh. This is a, a high res Hollywood grade model of the, the complex geometry of Kevin. Yeah, it might be the most high poly mesh in the game. <laughs> yeah, we had to, to be really careful with this one. And then I'll, I'll just drag this right into the view and there's Kevin in his untextured glory. But then we can go right over to his properties and set a material on him. So here's the, the Kevin material. But the great thing is that we're gonna give you the ability to uh, jump into these materials. And here you can see the node graph, which makes Kevin possible. So here's all of the bits and pieces that, uh, that define his surface. And we can even go in and make changes to them. So here's his base diffuse property. Uh, we can set this to uh, a garish shade of pink if we want. Uh, and then if we save this out, then Kevin, as you can see, is now pink. But we're going to set it back to something a little more Kevin-like. Oh. So now this is a, a quick section where we're just going to show some of the uh, the new object placement tools. So a quick shout out actually to Ashley Ludlam, one of the gameplay designers on Fortnite, who's actually doing the driving in this bit. Uh, so he's going to use the uh, the Unreal Editor toolset to build a small shrine to Kevin to kind of show this off. You see he's bringing in some static meshes, quickly adjusting their properties. And these are the same tools that our developers actually use to put the game itself together. So we're, our goal is to give you the same kind of power, the same tool set that we use to bring Fortnite to you season after season. Yeah, absolutely. Like really as one-to-one -one as possible from normal Unreal Engine workflows. Um, you know, it'll take us a while to get there, but, but um, we're super excited for this. Okay, we got, we have the, the three rocks. Of course, that's important. So you got your, you need something that looks very shriny. And so now here's, here's Kevin in his VFX Splendor. And we're gonna bring in a particle system. This is actually from a previous season of Fortnite. It's a, a little star dome. We'll put that on Kevin's head. Now, the neat thing is that we can actually jump into Niagara, which is the full particle system inside of Unreal. And you can see I can rotate around the particle system, take a look at the node graph definition, which defines this effect. And I could even go in and make this uh, my own customized version of this effect straight from the Fortnite content. There you have it. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. So now why don't we go and show kind of the another kind of big part of the tool set, which is essentially, uh, I think there's another video uh, for us actually. So, you know, you see some new buttons in the toolbar. One of them is upload project. And that will actually take the content that we just, you know, created and imported and um, upload it to the cloud and have it be processed in the cloud and deliver, deliver it to an actual running game session. So here was us actually playing around in Party Royale. You could see consoles playing, uh, you know, we had some capture team members on console and PC and, and it showed up in a normal Party Royale se session, which is pretty cool. Uh, the other part of this that we're doing is actually leverage, leveraging that connection to a running game, to allow you to make live edits uh, quickly and, and easy. And we support things right now like translation, rotation, um, but we really want to expand that over time. And I think one of the most powerful things that we've found, you know, developing creative um, is just how powerful quick iteration and faster iteration is. And, um, you know, and some of the things you can do in creative, like being able to do that with a full broad tool set is, is frankly amazing. Oh, not uh, so to nerd out, but about that. just the ability to be able to make edits like that on the fly that people could actually see live in game is that might be the most exciting aspect of this for me anyway. Oh yeah, yeah. And the thing is, it's one of the things that maybe not doesn't show off well on video, but I 100% I agree. Like this is the thing that I geek out on all the time, for sure. Um, so one cool thing, uh, just FYI, is that we kind of wanted to prove out the, the whole end-to-end -end flow. So we did push out this content, or actually an earlier version of this content, to Party Royale right now. So those people in game, feel free to head over there to where you see us editing, um, and you should be able to see a version of it. now. Please bear in mind, this part of it is probably the most kind of proof of concept. So don't be surprised if there are bugs in game. Um, but yeah, again, we really wanted to show everything end to end and thought that was really powerful. 
So um, we do know that this is kind of only one part of the tool set, right? This, this is content. And another thing that's really important is uh, code. So we are working on tools for that as well. Um, and we wanted to give you a quick early glimpse of that, of a new scripting language we're developing, uh, which Epic engineer Tim Telton is about to show us. So why don't we cue that video? Hello. I was part of the team that helped launch Fortnite Creative. Since then, the community has done some amazing things, and we want to give them even more tools to help build fun and engaging experiences inside of Fortnite. Let me walk you through an early prototype of one of these new tools, a game script used to implement Boxfight. We start the script by waiting for players to join. As you can see, some commands take time to complete, and the game continues on as this script waits for an event. Once players have joined, we start our game by setting the player's spawn points and inventory. To change things up, we use the current round variable inside this method to set up a different inventory in some of the rounds. Next, we make players invulnerable and start the round countdown timer. Partway through the countdown, we enable building so people can get ready to play. And we enable multiple round end conditions. Either one player can remain, or zero, or the round will time out. Returning to our game script, once the end conditions are met, we display a round end message. Then we disable combat and the storm. And then we reset everything for the next round and run the same script again. We can also tweak a few small changes to the player inventory items in script between rounds, like adding impulse grenades or clingers. Very small changes can have a dramatic impact on gameplay. This is a very early prototype, and we still have a lot of work ahead of us. But we're looking forward to what our creators will be able to do with much more powerful tools. Look forward to more details as we continue development in 2021. Awesome. Well, we're super excited to bring this to the community. Um, you know, in terms of time frame, we're not we're not sure. Probably some time in in 2021. Um, and you know, just like you were, we're seeing here, I think we'll, we'll want to iterate with the community and, and kind of get something out early as, as we can, but um, we'll see, we'll take a, things one step at a time. And the goal here is really to, to bring in more of the uh, Unreal Engine authorship tools that we use here at Epic. I mean, obviously you can already place objects in your Fortnite creative scenes. A lot of those types of things like move, rotate, scale, those have been there, yeah. but we want to give you access to your particle authoring tools or your material editor and, and things that we use to bring the game to life so that you can start making even more customized experiences yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like unlocking those tools in a way that, that you can leverage in creative, like there's some really powerful things there that we want to explore. Yeah, it's really awesome work. Congratulations, folks. And um, you know, this is an early peek at something that's in development, um, but you know, it's the first step into a, a larger world in which the, the world of Fortnite Creative and the world of the Unreal Engine and uh, the full set of tools that AAA developers use to build major console games uh, you know, converge um, to give creators even more power in the future. Um, you know, and these are two worlds that will coexist side by side with the Fortnite Creative mode. It, existing on every platform um, and every control scheme. And uh, you know, some of these advanced tools um, running on, on PCs uh, you know, for, for high-end developers. And it's gonna be the interplay between uh, you know, creators using uh, Fortnite Creative um, and uh, you know, developers using the, the tool set uh, working together that's going to create a lot of really interesting interactions. All right. Um, are you all ready to answer a couple of questions from chat? Yeah. Okay. Bring it. Cool. Um, Extra some five asked. Can you mod in any platform? And if so, do you need a third party app? Uh, so the 100% the goal is just like everything in Fortnite Creative and inside of Fortnite that everything you create works on every platform and you can publish and, and see it live on every platform. Um, which is why it was important to even demo the you know Windows and console together just to to to, to show that. Um, you know, the third-party tool is the Unreal Editor. So, you know, it's, it'll be, you know, a, a flavor of the Unreal Editor for sure with, with custom things for our tool set, like you saw the upload button, but 
um, you will be able to use, you know, external third-party tools like Maya and Max and Houdini and, um, you know, in terms of creating content. So that's, that's true. Yes. Leads us over to our next question. TitchMW asked, will you be able to import custom assets like models into the game? So to say yes, uh, absolutely. You know, I think we still have to w w figure out moderation and, you know, getting, um, you know, what that looks like uh, for sure. So we're a little thoughtful there. But uh, it's super powerful to be able to import your own assets and, and create content and create things that doesn't look like Fortnite and, and support that, so. That's right, and remember Fortnite uh, is going to be moving to Unreal Engine 5 uh, in 2021. And so a lot of these Unreal Engine 5 features you've seen demonstrated on the high end will, will become possible in this environment. Um, and they'll create a really interesting uh, a combination of Fortnite visual style, plus the option of having a, completely photorealistic content uh, in creator worlds as well. And all of those things that we were talking about to make make it easier to bring things in without worrying as much about optimization, it all applies here. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, that, that is one of the things that we're kind of working through. It's like taking some of those tool sets and workflows and figuring out the best manifestation of that for, for um, our, for the, the tool set. Um, you know, without sacrificing the tools and the power, but, you know, figuring out how to opti automatically optimize, like those are all things that we're, we're kind of taking into account as we iterate through all the, everything that we're, we're going to be doing over the next six months to a year. Moving back to a couple of the questions we received earlier in the stream here in regards to U5, um, Captain Gravyboat asked, which platforms will Nanite and Lumen support and how will the tech scale to lower end platforms? Uh, so the next generation, I guess their current generation consoles now, I guess we could call them, um, is definitely supported as well as uh, as well as a uh, high-end PC. Um, I don't I don't think we know yet as far as what how low it will scale. So I don't have uh, have anything to to report there, but it will definitely be be supporting in its highest fidelity there. And then we're going to have technology. Um, to make it so that the assets that were imported for that quality level can be uh, can be shipped um, across the, the full scale of platforms that, that UE5 supports. Right, so you, so you build your high-end movie quality content once um, and uh, players will see that directly on, on these high-end devices um, and then everywhere else it will be scaled down but it will still work. Exactly. Uh, at a lower level of visual quality without the micro polygon geometry. Moving on, um, Voxelize asked, Lumen video shows mostly diffuse bounce light. Is multiple bounces supported for specular as well? Uh, multiple bounces is supported by Lumen. Um, the uh, specular side of things is currently in, in rapid development. Um, multiple bounces will be supported by specular, but that doesn't mean there will necessarily be like full like caustic bounces. Um, so if you could see multiple bounces after the first bounce, it might be fairly diffuse for the rest of the bounces, but it won't just be like a complete loss of energy after it hits the first thing, if that makes sense. Misanthrope asked, will Nanite work with VR? Uh, yes. Uh, there, there's aspects of the of VR support. Um, it probably won't be there in the very first version that we released. The like early access version that we mentioned will be, be out at the beginning of next year, but um, it, it will be supported eventually um, by, by the time that we're ready for the full UE5 release. And then see, I think we had one more. Um, the Autumn asked, when will we see DLSS and ray trace global illumination from emissive materials added to the engine? Um, DLSS and uh, Ray Trace Global Illumination um, already shipped in Fortnite, I believe. Um, as far as bounces from emissive, uh, I'm not sure the answer to that. Moving on then a little bit, we had a couple of questions in regards to virtual production as well. Um, Jemerson Art asked, have you looked at the methods being explored by companies like Corridor Digital regarding connecting their camera systems in via LiveLink and how you deal with those large data streams, including motion capture and facial capture as well. Uh, Non-LED screens, but still fast responsiveness. 
I don't have a particular answer for that one in terms of um, in terms of virtual production, but I do know that we're always working on latency and we've been tracking that down for a while and it's always improving in terms of cameras. Um, and so I think overall speeding up our systems are one of the core things that we're always working on because we like to have quick feedback when we're on stage uh, for everybody for everybody that's there. We see another question here in regards to Lumen and Nanite. Um, Lorash asked, Will Lumen and Nanite work at all with forward rendering or MSAA? Um, Nanite will not be supporting MSAA. Um, Lumen doesn't necessarily have a um, particular care in that. <laughs> um, so what was the other part? The forward rendering. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, I'm not sure whether that is currently working, but there's no limitation there as far as us making that work. Um, if it's not currently working. So yeah, we, we can support forward rendering with, with Nanite. Uh, I'm not sure the answer for Lumen, but I suspect the answer for Lumen is no uh, for forward rendering uh, because I expect that uh, Lumen is gonna want to do its various bounces and multiple passes in a deferred nature. So I expect it's gonna need to have uh, the G buffer to be able to do that. And forward rendering won't, won't be providing that. Um, but I, I'm not the expert on the, the Lumen system to give a definitive answer there. But um, I would I would predict the answer is no on the, the Lumen side. Moving back a little bit to the um, Fortnite Creative announcement, um, what sort of scripting language did you demonstrate in Fortnite Creative today? Well, it's a new one, um, and uh, it's uh, been in development, and the, the ideas have been brewing within Epic for quite a while. Um, We'll have a lot more to say about it um, in, uh, in 2021, uh, but uh, I think you'll find it interesting. There are some uh, ideas there which are fairly new to programming languages, which uh, make development, and particularly game development, um, you know, easier than it's typically been um, in dealing with you know, complex interactions between objects. So stay tuned for details later. And what does this mean for uh, existing Unreal Engine developers? Well, um, so uh, when we build something at Epic, we, uh, we try to make it available to all of our licensees. Um, and we're building a, a lot of these tools uh, in Fortnite, uh, you know, in Fortnite first. Um, and so the, the scripting effort is being nurtured within Fortnite. Um, and we expect it will come into the Unreal Engine later on um, after it's uh, really been proven out there. Um, and similarly, the, a lot of the tools that we've uh, demonstrated here, such as live editing, where you can edit a level um, on, in the editor on PC and see it uh, deploy in real time to all, all of these other platforms. Um, you know, these, these technology pieces are, uh, some are available to licensees now and some are coming in the next version of Unreal Engine um, 4 and will be in you know, part of Unreal Engine 5 from the beginning. How closely do the new Fortnite creative tools resemble um, the vanilla Unreal Editor? I mean, what you saw was essentially what we're using internally now for for our development. Um, so pretty pretty close. What the final version of it looks in terms of skinning or you know uh, the title or anything, we'll, we'll see. But we actually we absolutely want to keep it as close to one to one as possible. I mean, that was the actual material editor, and that that was Niagara that that we looked at. Yeah, right. In the same, you know, like actually the same editor that we use to build the content that we shipped with, yeah. uh, you know, in game. So. so on that note, if you are excited about the new Fortnite creative tools, you can start using them. Uh, some of those tools already in Unreal Engine right now. You can go download 426. It's available in the launcher. See, so moving back to uh, some of our uh, virtual production technology, um, Marco Mello asked, how much can your virtual set technology evolve? I've noticed the current sets are incredibly cylindrical. Is there any way to reformat these designs for further immersion? I'm, I'm guessing he's talking about the uh, LED walls and that's an area I'm not uh, familiar with in terms of future technology of that. Um, that'd be, maybe we can answer that uh, in the chat later. Let's see, uh, Kupinator asked, what is being put in place to prevent the higher graphical fidelity needs of ArchVis and virtual production from impacting the performance of Unreal Engine in mobile and other low-end devices? Um, is performance on low-end devices still a priority for Unreal Engine? Yeah, I mean, I believe that we're always, always looking at that. 
uh, it's very important because we, you know, in, so, in some cases we do use lower end, lower end devices for some of our workflows. Um, and so I think it's always very important for us to keep that in mind. And having, having been a developer for many years, like one of the things I, I really like about this engine is it is very, um, it considers those type of things um, and, you know, helps, helps with our workflows quite a bit. So I would expect, yeah. Yeah, it, it's definitely a challenge for sure uh, to, to cover the just like extremely wide range of scalability that Unreal has to cover from um, going all the way up to uh, needs that people have for just like offline rendering all the way down to it needs to run fast on a, on a, a, a phone. Like that, that scale yeah. is huge. But those are things that we consider with every decision that we make um, of how can we encapsulate things? How can we isolate them um, such that we can not be constrained to be able to push forward the one end of the spectrum um, without pulling up the other end of the spectrum too much. Uh, there's, there's times at which we need to, to cut off things at the lower end of you know, very old APIs and um, old pieces of hardware and things like that. Like there, there is a march of progress that happens at times, um, but we, we certainly can't just like lop off the whole bottom half of our support range just because we wanna add some, some extra little slice at the top. Uh, it's something we're always cognizant of. Going back to Fortnite Creative um, and some of the new tools that have been shown, um, we've seen some folk ask in chat, um, I spent a bunch of time learning the creative tool set. Will I have to relearn everything? Um, and then maybe a follow-up question would be, what's a good way to learn the Unreal Engine workflows? So the answer to the first question, I think, is absolutely not. Like we, you know, like we mentioned, we view them as complementary. You know, like the, there's real power to being able to sit on a couch and have a controller and, and create things with your friends and you know see it live on screen. Like you know, that's some of the power that we're trying to unlock in the editor. But there's a real power to doing that on console. So uh, absolutely not. We view this as, as things that are complementary. And who knows? Maybe you can build things in Fortnite in in sort of a tool set and bring in creative or vice versa. There's lots of things that that we'd love to, to you know, iterate and, and experiment with. And as, I mean, as far as learning the engine goes, there's a, a ton of great resources that uh, our, our learning team has put out over the last uh, year, actually right down to the last couple of months as 426 has dropped. You can go to uh, learn.unrealengine.com and uh, see a, a variety of videos and examples. On the, the learn tab of the engine launcher, you can download a lot of examples from us and, and dig through those and see how we put things together. And you could technically become kind of like a, a master of these tools before you ever see this stuff in Fortnite. And there are plenty of community tutorials and resources as well existing all over the internet. If you're looking for those resources, make sure you visit our forums at forums.unrealengine.com. There's also our unofficial Discord community, unrealslackers.org. Um, I think they reached over 50,000 members recently, uh, where daily there are active discussions in all fields uh, and industries within Unreal Engine. Um, we also recently just held the 2020 Epic Mega Jam, um, which is mostly talked about around there. Um, before I start doing my sort of little outro spiel here, is there anything else uh, one of our guests would like to mention for our audience here today? Well, I just wanted to say that you know, all of this is, while we've talked about a lot, talked a lot today about what Epic's done and our very exciting 2020, um, we always have to give a shout out to what's been created in the community. We have such an incredible community of developers and creators and partners, and they make so much of this possible by pushing us to be better, pushing us to make better tools and just working on really, really rad projects. And uh, honestly, I feel like we have one of the best communities ever. Like you all are so great. You're so supportive. It's so absolutely creative. And we're really, really lucky to have you. And I know this is super gushy, but it's the end of the year and we get to be that way, darn it. So um, I just want to say like, we, we couldn't do all this and we are so privileged and honored to be part of this, you know, journey with you all. And so. Happy I do want to uh, just to follow up on that. I want to give a quick shout out to the team that helped put together the the live the the demo and the, sort of all of it. Uh, it was a lot of work and and it's kind of humbling and um, you know we're super excited and maybe a little healthily scared for uh, the next <laughs> several years. Uh, but yeah, yeah. We're, we're excited. Yeah, and thanks to everybody who's put their trust in Epic. Um, uh, whether you're a game developer or a Fortnite creator. Um, 
we've accomplished so much together. It's uh, astonishing. Um, and uh, really grateful for everybody's support. And um, uh, we're doing a lot of good things and we're fighting some good fights. And um, I think uh, this is opening up the doors to uh, a whole lot more opportunity in the future um, you know, of, uh, of Fortnite, of game development in general, and of you know, this new medium that seems to be coming together as a result of uh, 3D gaming uh, meeting mass consumer entertainment, which science fiction calls the metaverse. And we don't know exactly what it is, but we're building it together. <laughs> That's the most awesome part of, uh, of this whole experiment. So thank you all. And thank you all, Amanda, Brian, Grayson, Tim, Carlos, and Zach for coming on today, um, talking to our community about all the amazing things that happened and what is to come. Now the Fortnite creative team did want me to mention that they actually released new Fortnite creative documentation so if you go to fn.gg slash creative docs, you can find new documentation on how you can utilize Fortnite Creative today. Uh, and big thanks to everyone who's watching today, whether it was on Twitch or in Part of Real. Uh, we're really happy to have you here. To let you know, we stream every, every Thursday on Twitch, not for the next two weeks, bear in mind, because Epic is going on our winter break. Um, but the first week back on January 7th, we will have Shord coming on talking about our new water tools in Unreal Engine 426. Uh, get excited for that. If you want to get prepared for that, there's al already a video on our YouTube channel where Short is going through some of those, but he's doing a, a deeper uh, deep dive and you'll have the opportunity to ask him questions live. Um, and chat, please give it up for all of you and for our guests here today. It's been a pleasure to have you all. Um, like I said, we will see you again when we are back next year. Not in part of real, bear in mind. Um, it's been exciting to be able to do there, to be there today. Uh -huh. We'll see what the future brings in terms of that. Um, and with that said, I think it's time for all of us to say goodbye. Um, and I really mean it from the bottom of my heart. So I want to say thank you all for being such an awesome community. It's a pleasure to work with you. And I hope to get to see all of your amazing creations in the future um, and in the past as well. Please make sure you let us know what you're working on. Forums, Discord, Twitter, just make sure you hit us up. We're always excited. With that said, let's all wave goodbye while the intro plays. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.